Welcome everyone to the launch of Stephen Kimber's most recent book, Alexa, Changing the Face of Canadian Politics. My name is Kellyanne Mullinen. As current chair of Mount St. Vincent University's Alexa McDonough Institute, it is my privilege to be your MC for this evening. Tonight's event is hosted by the Alexa McDonough Institute in partnership with Goose Lane Editions. Although we are coming to you virtually, it is nonetheless important to begin by acknowledging that our organizations are located on unceded Indigenous land. More specifically, Mount St. Vincent University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and Goose Lane Editions is located in the traditional unceded territory of Wulastawik and Mi'kmaq peoples. These territories are covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wulastuic people first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wulastuic title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between the nations. Thank you for joining us tonight from wherever you currently find yourself. In a few moments, we will kick off our lineup with short videos featuring special guests that have been produced by Goose Lane to mark this occasion. Unfortunately, Alexa recently had some minor surgery and is recovering, so she won't be able to join us on screen tonight, but we hope she'll still be able to watch and enjoy the tributes. After the recorded videos, Stephen Kimber will join us to offer his reflections and answer questions that have already been submitted by audience members. First, however, please allow me to say a few words about Stephen Kimber and his book, Alexa. Stephen Kimber is a professor of journalism at the University of King's College in Halifax and a co-founder of the university's Master of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction program. He is an award-winning broadcaster, editor, and writer who has authored two novels and 10 nonfiction books, including What Lies Across the Water, The Real Story of the Cuban Five. Stephen worked for Alexa McDonough as a freelance speechwriter in the early days of her NDP leadership in Nova Scotia. With the new title that we have gathered this evening to celebrate, Stephen chronicles Alexa's life and political career, and with it weaves a narrative of the changing attitudes toward women in politics, from Alexa's early battles as the lone female MLA in a hostile Nova Scotia legislature, to her leadership of the federal NDP, to her role as senior stateswoman in Jack Layton's shadow cabinet. Along the way, Stephen delves into Alexa's personal life to uncover the origins of her political career, her upbringing in a wealthy family committed to progressive politics, her tight-knit circles of female friends, her personal metamorphosis from wife of to leader of, and her emergence as a political leader whose importance goes beyond partisan politics. The result is an engrossing story of one of Canada's most beloved politicians whose common touch and lifelong advocacy of progressive causes made her a significant player in Canadian public life. Alexa is available now in bookstores everywhere. You may purchase copies locally from the event's official bookseller, King's Co-op Bookstore, at Bookmark Halifax, or another independent bookseller. Alexa is also available for purchase at Chapters, Indigo, and Cole's locations, or online at www.gooselane.com. Oriana, are you ready to roll our videos? Hi, everyone. Greetings from Ontario. I wish I could be there with you. I wish that we could get together to celebrate the, uh, the launch of this great book. Um, to Alexa, and to Stephen Kimber and to everyone involved in the project, congratulations. It really is an important part of Canadian history. I never had the opportunity to work with Alexa McDonough. Um, I wish I had Alexa, I wish we could have uh, worked together, I wish we'd known each other. Because as I read your book, I was bolstered by and heartened by the, the stories that, uh, that defined you, the, uh, the struggles that we all share as, uh, as female politicians, the nonsense that we have to put up with, and the, uh, the way you kept your sense of humor and your wit. So um, I'm really glad this book has been written. I'm glad that people across the country and, uh, and beyond, but especially women and young women, are going to have the opportunity to read this important story of your life in politics and your your life in Canada 
because we need more women to step up. We need more women to know that despite all the nonsense, despite having to take on the, you know, the vestiges of the patriarchy or the patriarchy, however you define it, um, it is so worth it. It's so worth it to have the opportunity to change people's lives and to represent them in uh, a way that has integrity. You did that, Alexa. Thank you so much. And the book is beautifully written. It's a, it's a great read. Congratulations and all the best of luck. My name is Ken Rockwood, and I'm really glad to be part of this launch of Stephen Kimber's book on Alexa McDonough. Um, I've known Alexa for a long time, and that's in part because uh, when I met her first, it was in relationship to her dad who had Alzheimer's disease. And back in those days, there wasn't a whole lot that we could do for people with Alzheimer's, um, but we did our best. And um, then I saw her intermittently at various Alzheimer's Society events and such over the next 20 years. Now, I'm a doctor, and normally, like any doctor, you couldn't beat it out of me to talk about a patient in public, but I have Alexa's permission for this, and I want to tell you why. So she's a patient of mine now, and has been for several years, and she's an example of someone who has done really, really well on treatment. In fact, I recall seeing her uh, speak on the radio, sorry, on the TV uh, in French, and my heart was in my mouth because I was wondering whether she could pull it off. And she did. And it was really fantastic to see. And I've seen many examples of where she's risen to the occasion, but also where she's contributed in a very full way over a period of time, and knowing that she's been on treatment for several years now. I was so impressed when she wanted to share the story because she wanted people to understand that dementia, particularly in those who are fortunate enough to respond to treatment is very different from what it was when her dad had it. And we have to approach dementia with realism, but with optimism for the results that we can often see and see in people like her. And it just struck me as, you know, here's someone who's clearly going the extra mile. It speaks to the core, the sort of woman that she is, that even in something that for a long time people found shameful, she's willing to share. So, so I'm, really glad for the opportunity to use this to highlight uh, what dementia can be like, why we have to get on with treatment, why we need to pursue dementia research with vigor, why we need a better national dementia strategy than we have now. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Alexa, changing the face of Canadian politics is a deeply personal yet objective informative and thought-provoking account of one of the most influential trailblazers in Canada's history. The stories of Alexa's teen years and the work she and her friends did to challenge racism and classism in Halifax truly resonated with me. Alexa used her privilege to affect change, a lesson that I found to be a powerful tool throughout my social work career. This biography showcases examples of positive disruption in action and offers readers a documented legacy of a political leader we can all emulate. Alexa was an authentic ally who worked tirelessly to bring voices from the margins to the center of discussions. She was always so encouraging and supportive. I will be forever grateful for the personal and professional mentorship and sponsorship that she so freely gave to me and so many others. This book will certainly inspire generations to continue the work that Alexa McDonough started. Now, when I picked up this book, it was pretty early in, in the prologue, actually, not even chapter one, where I came across a passage and I knew I was going to love it. This is, this is what I read. 
McDonough deserves much more credit than she's been given for the fact that the then newly minted Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau could respond to a reporter's question about why he decided to, to appoint Canada's first ever gender balanced cabinet with an almost flippant, because it's 2015. It became 2015 in no small measure because of Alexa McDonough. When I read that, my eyes filled up with tears a little bit um, to read that so early in the book because I knew that I was finally going to be able to read something that captured Alexa's profound impact on politics and Canadian society. While Alexa McDonough was never Premier or Prime Minister, she truly did change the face of Canadian politics, both capital P and small p politics. Now, I was lucky enough to be voted the MP for Halifax after Alexa. I could probably write a book about the ways that she has influenced my life, but I won't because unlike Stephen Kimber, I am no author. But I did want to share how much Alexa's work her doggedness on issues, her fearlessness to speak out for what was just, it gave me courage. I will never say that I lived up to that bar she set, but I tried for it. I tried for it because I had a role model, someone who challenged Islamophobia before I even really knew what the word meant. Someone who talked about challenging the patriarchy when that seemed like a radical idea to me, she was a white woman who wasn't scared to call out racism and who showed up in solidarity as an ally. I saw her do those things and it gave me the courage to try and do them too. Thank you, Stephen Kimber, for doing this work, for piecing together Alexa's story with such care and for not only shining a light on her accomplishments, but also ensuring that her humanity shone through as well. Friends, I'm really excited to be a part of the launch of the book that outlines the life of Alexa. And a big thank you to Stephen Kimber for writing this book. Alexa is one of the leaders that built our movement. And one of the reasons why I'm here is because of the legacy that Alexa McDonough left behind a legacy for fighting for justice and fairness. She will always be remembered for her work on disarmament, her work on justice and peace, her work on social justice, her work to tackle misogyny and to advocate for better justice and fairness for women particularly. I want to just say uh, thank you so much, Alexa, for everything you've done for our movement. I am walking in the legacy you've left behind and I hope to continue those same battles for more fairness and justice for all. And thank you once again to Stephen Kimber for writing the story that outlines the impact that Alexa has had on not just Nova Scotia, but all of Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Ariana, and thank you so much to our special guests for contributing these thoughtful and moving greetings. I'm now very pleased to turn the conversation over to Stephen Kimber for his reflections about Alexa, the person, the politician, and the book. Welcome and congratulations, Stephen. Uh, thank you very much, Kellyanne, and thank you for that generous introduction. And thanks to all the folks who said such nice things earlier on. I do truly appreciate it. Thank you, too, to the Alexa McDonough Institute and to Goose Lane Editions for co-sponsoring and perhaps more particularly for co-organizing tonight's event. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I can't see you, of course, but I know you're out there on the other side of my screen, and that makes me very happy. It's unfortunate that we can't be together in person tonight, but perhaps I can steal a line from Alexa herself. As many of you will know, she has always been that optimistic, glass half full Pollyanna, finding the good news and even the bleakest election outcomes. So in that spirit, I will channel Alexa and make the point that because we're online, we can bring more people in more places together for an event like this, including, and this I'm definitely pleased to say, some folks at the seniors facility in Alexa in Halifax, where Alexa now lives. I understand they've set up a watch party in the library there so residents can see this event as well. So a very special welcome to all of them. There are a few other thank yous I need to offer tonight, first and foremost to Alexa herself. One of the many things I discovered researching this book is just how many times over the years people had asked Alexa to either write her own book 
or had offered to write one for her. I'm glad she was always too busy being Alexa to stop long enough to write such a book herself or to have one written. And I'm grateful she finally agreed to allow me to write this one. Thanks too to her sons, Justin and Travis and brother Robbie, who understood a book really did need to be written about their mother and sister and were kind enough to ask me to write it. The publisher describes this as an authorized biography, and it is. But everyone was clear from the beginning I should follow the story wherever it led, and I did. And no one ever once said don't. An author couldn't ask for better authorizers. I also want to thank Pat Kipping and Barbara Jack. They recorded in-depth interviews with Alexa long before I came on the scene and generously shared them with me. They, along with Joan Hicks, yet another friend of Alexa's, if you read the book, you'll discover there are always still more friends of Alexa, were ultimately responsible for bringing me into this project, thanks to them all. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about writing the book, read a few short excerpts from it, and try to answer some questions that people have submitted. When I first sat down with Alexa for what turned out to be about 20 hours worth of in-person interviews, I remember asking her if she had any letters or documents that might be helpful in my research. No, she said, every time she'd moved over the years, she'd just gotten rid of stuff, sorry. Fast forward six months later, Alexa was moving out of her condo and her son Justin called me. As they were packing for the move, he said they discovered a couple of dozen bankers boxes filled with old correspondence, papers, photos, many in a basement storage locker. Did I want to have a look? I did. The boxes turned out to be a biographer's dream. As a researcher, you can't top the feeling you get when you can open a window into someone's life at a particular moment by reading the letters they wrote at that time. For me, one of many aha moments during my research came when I read some letters Alexa had written home to her fiance while she was still a graduate student at Smith College in the early 1960s. As young couples do, Alexa and Peter were discussing their relationship in their letters. In more than one letter, Alexa wrote that if she ever had to choose between having a career as a social worker and being Mrs. Peter J. E. McDonough, she would always choose to be Mrs. Peter McDonough. Reading those words written in, 19, in the 1960s in 2020, my first reaction was surprise. But yet, as I thought about it, I realized that Alexa was very much both a woman of her times and also one of those women who would go on to change those times for herself and for women who came after. One of the turning points for Alexa's own political and feminist consciousness happened in 1973. By then, she'd become a social worker, but she was also a young mother. She'd recently quit the Liberal Party, disillusioned at its failure to take social policy as seriously as she did. Her father, Lloyd, who was one of the founders of the CCFNDP, of course, sensed an opportunity. He offered to pay for Alexa to attend a socialist conference in Regina. Alexa's mother, Jean, sensing another kind of opportunity, urged Alexa to share a room at the conference with Grace McGinnis. McGinnis was not only a family friend, but also an unapologetic feminist politician. She was the only woman elected to the House of Commons in 1968. Grace McGinnis would quickly become an inspiration and a role model for Alexa. There's a clear line, in fact, from that conference to Alexa's career and in a sense, back to this book. That conference was the first ever sponsored by a then new organization called the Douglas Caldwell Foundation. It had been formed to honor two of the founders of Canada's socialist movement, and it described itself as an instrument of research and education for Canadian socialists. It certainly was that for Alexa. Fast forward more than 40 years, it was the Douglas Caldwell Foundation that initially supported Pat Kipping's oral history interviews with Alexa, which she then shared with me, and later the foundation became one of the funders for this biography. So everything connects in some way or another, which is not unusual, you'll discover, in the world of Alexa. Tonight, as I mentioned, I will read a couple of scenes from the book. One is political and more bitter than sweet. The other is personal and sweet, and I think captures a sense of just who Alexa is 
and why she has been so influential for so many in this country. The first scene comes from what Alexa herself has described as the worst moment of her political career. It was 1988, and the NDP in Nova Scotia seemed poised for an electoral breakthrough. Sound familiar? That's happened a lot over the years. This breakthrough had been particularly hard won, and won mostly by Alexa herself. The party had scratched and crawled its way from the one seat Alexa had won in 1981 all the way back to three seats in 1984. By 1988, John Buchanan's Tory government was mired in scandal after scandal. The liberal opposition was in disarray. Alexa had somehow tapped into mounting citizen anger at Nova Scotia's patronage system, which still permeated every aspect of life in Nova Scotia, from road paving to the appointment of judges. By this point, Alexa had become, in fact, the province's most popular political leader, even if her party was not. The NDP had done polling in one rural riding a pollster thought might be typical, typical in the sense perhaps that the party had always come last there too. They'd polled in just that one riding because that was all they could afford to do at the time. But the poll showed they might be able to win the riding. And if they could win there, remember I did say Alexa was an optimist. Some people even unreasonably thought the party might have a reasonable chance to become the official opposition. And then came this phone call. Alexa, the voice at the other end of the line was tentative. The voice belonged to Bob Levy, the NDP's other star MLA. It was the morning of July 29th, 1988, and Nova Scotia was days, perhaps hours, from the launch of a provincial general election campaign. I'm afraid I'm calling with some bad news, Levy began. He paused. Was he sick, Alexa wondered? Bob, are you okay? I'm not running. He said it quickly, blurted it out almost, then stopped, waited. Not running. What was he saying? Not running. Bob, you can't. <coughs> Excuse me. Not on such short notice. The election's about to be called and he cut her off. Wait, Alexa, you'd better hear the rest because you're not going to be happy when I tell you what I'm doing. I've accepted a judgeship. Silence, stunned silence. Bob, you can't. I already did. She didn't cry, Alexa would remember later, but I felt like it. Instead, she argued, she cajoled, she begged. Forget me, forget John Holmes, she told him. We can recover one way or the other, and it's not your responsibility to worry about us. But can't you just think about all those people who bled for you, who worked their guts out to get you elected, who gave you money they couldn't afford, who pounded on doors for you, who pounded the pavement, broke ranks with their traditional Tory and liberal roots just to support you. They're going to be devastated. You can't be. She stopped, waited. There was another strained, awkward silence from Levy's end of the phone, incredulity and mounting anger from hers. You can't be serious, she continued finally. I mean, you have to wait at least until after the election. It's done, he said flatly. The deal's only on offer if I'm willing to, his voice trailed off. The announcement is going to be made tomorrow and they're going to call the election on Saturday. Finally, Alexa McDonough, whose relentlessness and persuasiveness in discussions had become legendary, faced reality. There's no point, it's over, she thought to herself. It's just going to be a hell of an election. It would be. They hung up with the most perfunctory of goodbyes. Thirty years later, the wounds were still raw, the scabs unhealed. Once in a while, Alexis said, someone will ask me, what's the worst thing that ever happened in all your years of politics? Her unequivocal answer, the personal and political devastation of Bob Levy's phone call that morning. Alexa saw it as a betrayal of everything they'd stood for, fought against, schemed and dreamed about, even imagined one day would happen. Bob Levy, unsurprisingly, sees it differently. But none of that mattered. The end result was that after their conversation ended that morning, fully resolved and yet not resolved at all, the two former political soulmates would not speak another word to one another for more than 25 years. And then, even when they met by chance, their conversation would be perfunctory, elliptical, never quite getting to the questions both of them so desperately wanted answered. 
The second scene I want to highlight tonight is much more recent and much more upbeat. It happened close to a decade ago. By that point, Alexa had retired from politics, elective politics, that is. Uh, and as I researched this time in her life, I discovered Alexa was still con connected and often reconnected with people who'd been important in her life. She'd often visit Harold Kroll, for example, her first boss at Halifax's planning department, who'd been one of her important mentors. Kroll was then in his 80s and suffering from Parkinson's. Alexa would often visit with him, reading him books or even the latest news. There'd also been that brief, awkward reunion with Bob Levy at an NDP convention. It hadn't gone as well as either of them had hoped it would. Uh, I don't think it, that's, that's true anyway, but it did happen. But the scene I want to read from tonight details another moment of reconnection between Alexa and someone she'd intersected with over the years. Excuse me. George Eliot Clark didn't hear the message on his answering machine until he arrived at his office that Monday morning in 2012. Hi, George. It's Alexa McDonough calling. It had been close to 50 years since Alexa, an undergraduate psychology student at Dalhousie University, did her student placement at a preschool run by Clark's mother. George, who was four at the time, remembered having a precocious crush on the young woman he later sometimes referred to as his first teacher. Today, of course, George Eliot Clark was one of the country's most celebrated writers, a governor general's award-winning uh, poet, a playwright, and a novelist. His day job was as a professor of English at the University of Toronto. Although the two hadn't really ever been close, their paths had often crossed. In 2009, for example, Alexa attended a reading Clark gave at a Halifax fundraiser. After the event, Alexa, who was by then officially retired from politics, asked me if I would consider being a candidate for the NDP in the next election. She said she had spoken to Jack Layton and he was supportive. Clark demurred, but he was flattered to have been asked. And it wasn't the only or even the first time Alexa tried to convince George to become more involved in party politics. In 1979, when Alexa was the New Democratic Party's freshly anointed candidate for the 1979 federal general election, they'd met for coffee at the soda fountain inside Coombs Drugstore, an iconic landmark on Gottingen Street in Halifax's North End. By then, George from preschool now sported the giant afro and had become radicalized. He followed the Black Panthers, Red Mao and Lenin, and was at that very moment organizing what he hoped would become a militant black youth organization to demand social change. Despite, or perhaps because of all of that, Alexa had reached out to him. She tried to convince me to help out with canvassing, he told me later with a laugh. At that point, I was too far to the left, even if it was Alexa doing the asking. He paused in our conversation. Still, he said, it meant a lot to me that you would ask. We had a very nice conversation. In 2010, when Clark's opera, Trudeau, Long March, Shining Path, about the late former prime minister, got its first and only live production at Dalhousie University's Dunn Theater in Halifax, Alexa was in the audience. More than that, Clark told me, she made a meaningful to the producer's financial contribution just to help stage the production. When Alexa left her message on Clark's telephone answering machine that Sunday morning, she had just finished reading Clark's weekly column in the Halifax Chronicle Herald. His column that day had focused on Omar Carter, the Canadian child soldier. Carter had been taken to Afghanistan by his father, an Al Qaeda supporter, and been captured in a 2002 firefight with US forces. He would spent nearly a decade in prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, under pressure, he'd agreed to plead guilty to murder in violation of the laws of war in hopes of being transferred to Canada to serve the rest of his eight year sentence. That had in fact just happened when Clark wrote his column. I loved your article today, Alexa said into the machine. It is a continuing horror that he's still in prison. In her own later years as a politician, of course, Alexa had become one of our most important voices against Islamophobia. But that wasn't really why she was calling that morning. Whenever she read his column, she told him, I just think of how proud your mom and dad would be and what wonderful, wonderful human beings they were. 
And it is amazing that you, smart, saucy little kid with a huge sense of humor from a young age, have turned into such a worldly figure and philosopher king. And I just want you to know I loved your parents. And I just think of them every Sunday morning with mostly a big smile and just often a tear or two. As I say, no reason to return my call. I just wanted to let you know that. Why think it and not pass it along? Take care. George Eliot Clark himself shed a tear or two listening to that message, which he has never erased from his machine. I just couldn't, he told me. It's impossible to capture the subject of a biography or the book itself in just a few short excerpts like uh, these ones tonight, as we authors always like to say, read the book. I do hope you will. In the course of writing it, I have to say I learned a lot about a politician whose importance transcended politics, about a woman whose determination opened doors for other women who followed in her footsteps, about a person whose life is an example we could all hope to emulate. I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. And let me turn the proceedings back to Kellyanne, who I believe uh, may have some questions for me. Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing just a few of the stories from Alexa's very storied life. Um, it's been wonderful listening. Um, so yes, we have some questions that have been contributed uh, in advance by some of our audience members. Um, and I guess the, the first one that um, I will offer is this. Um, did you have any reservations about writing this biography? And why or why not? I did. Uh, I, there were strange reservations in a certain way. I, I didn't know that there was anything more to be said about Alexa. I had, uh, you know, I'd watched her career. I'd written about her from time to time. Uh, she was very open about everything, not just her politics, but also her personal relationships and all of that sort of thing. At first, I thought there's really not much more to be said here. But then as I... Um, began to do the research, I realized that there's a whole, there are other layers here that that were worth uh, looking into. And for me, it was, you know, that was sort of one revelation after another as I went along and I learned more and more about her and, and uh, her life. So yes, I had reservations, but I very quickly was able to put them aside uh, and was very happy to be able to, to write the book. Thank you. Um, what was your favorite part to write? Well, I, I won't say it was my favorite part to write, but it was my favorite part to research. And research is like detective work. And it, it's, as an author, it's, it's one of the really interesting, fun things that you do before you have to sit down and try and make it all fit together on paper. And early on in the conversations with Alexa and with her brother, I understood that there was a, a very important event that had happened before either of them were born, which was a, the a messy divorce between Alexa's uh, grandmother and grandfather. And, uh, you know, they told me that, that that had affected Alexa's mother and therefore gone down sort of and affected the, the kids in, in, in other ways and, and if influenced who she became as an adult. And I really wanted to know more about that. Uh, and the understanding was that this um, had happened uh, because Alexa's grandfather had a long running affair with his head nurse. He was a doctor. Um, and so I thought, OK, well, uh, let me get the, the court records and I could so I can confirm the details of this. So I went to the archives, which is where you would normally go for this sort of thing and, and looked in the, the records. It wasn't there. So I went to the archivist and I said, can you help me here? And they scoured the public archives looking for the court records from the divorce and couldn't find it. So then they said, well, why don't you try uh, the provincial courthouse, see if the, the, there's anything there. So I went there and they said, no, try the Toro courthouse because that's where they were at the time. Nothing there. Uh, we tried federally. Uh, everybody was so helpful and so cooperative in terms of trying to find this information, but it just was not there. They could not find it. So um, at some point I decided, okay, I have to write this. There was, there was one uh, document that I found from 1924, and I found it because uh, Robbie, uh, Alexa's brother, had told me uh, that the case had actually, the, the divorce case for some reason, had been a subject of uh, 
precedent and, and had been taught in law school. Uh, so I tried that. I tried the Dow Library. They couldn't find the, the case itself, but they found this document from 1924, which said uh, that the divorce had been granted on the grounds of adultery, but or not granted on the grounds of adultery, but granted on the grounds of, of cruelty. And this seemed very strange to me because I didn't know that cruelty had been a, a, a cause that would be successful in most divorce cases at that time. And so I started to dig into that. And I couldn't find it. So I thought, finally, I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll try and write about the issue of cruelty in relation to divorce cases in Nova Scotia. And I'll sort of get around what I don't know that way. And so I, I began looking at academic papers on this. And academics are so great. They footnote everything, right? So they, this was an academic uh, who wrote about this case. And it was. It was a big deal in 1922 because of, of what the judge said about uh, the husband and, and why he was granting the divorce. And he had, in his footnote, he had the, the reference number from the archives. So I went back to the archives. And it turned out he had been there all along, but it had been uh, you know, hidden away and lost the somewhere in the in the records, and they found it and brought it out, and it was a gold mine of information. I mean, so it, it, in the book, it takes up about three or four pages, but in my mind, it 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 w it became this thing that I had to find, and so finding that was a big step, and it was and and again, it was important uh, in terms of the book. The second thing that was important, maybe again, it turned, this is all background stuff rather than Alexa stuff, but still important, <laughs> was that in uh, 1933, I think it was, Alexa's mother, who was then a young woman, tried to commit suicide. She jumped into the river uh, in Boston uh, where she was a student. And you'd never find, I mean, I knew that this had happened from talking to, to the family. But nobody really knew much about it, and and nobody would know anything about it because in those days, certainly we didn't. As well, I say, those days we, uh, those days reporters didn't didn't uh, write about suicides or attempted suicides. But what happened when I looked at when I searched it in the, in the the archives, I found a reference to a young Harvard student who had won the Carnegie Medal for bravery for having saved Alexa's mother or Alexa's grand Alexa's mother. Yes, that was who it was. Uh, and so I had, again, a piece of information that you only get through that kind of, I mean, that was luck, but, uh, that kind of detective work is what you do when you're writing a book, you're always looking for, for information and then trying to make sense of it. And, and, and those two examples are probably, uh, they were the most fun for me. They may not have been the most fun for other people and they didn't take up all that much room in the book, but they were, they were important things for me to find out. Thank you for that. That response was just so rich in terms of the pieces of Alexa's um, history that you touched on, but also in terms of shedding some light on the labor that goes into um, producing a, a work like this. Um, this next question, I, I think you've already responded to in a couple of different ways, but I, I bet you'll have more responses to it um, <laughs> as well. Um, and the question is as follows. What was something new that you learned about Alexa while you were writing this book that surprised you? Well, I think that the biggest thing, it wasn't, it was new and it wasn't new. And that is the, something I mentioned in, in the, the talk earlier, which was this, the letters that she wrote back to Peter from Smith College. Uh, and when you're reading those through the lens of 2020, and you're seeing something that you, you don't expect of this woman who has become uh, a feminist icon, a politician, uh, very much a women's rights uh, activist, uh, writing about how she would rather give up her career uh, because of her husband. And, and then he, I realized, okay, I'm five years younger than Alexa, so we're not that far out of, out of sync. That was a big five years, uh, you know, Beatles and, and a lot of uh, other things happened in, the, in those five years. But if you look back, I mean, I think she grew up a child of the 50s and, and that post-war period, uh, we still, you know, all, the, all those things about marriage and, and women's place and all that stuff were very much uh, of a piece at the time. 
And then what happened, and not just with Alexa, I mean, I don't want to make it sound like she was so different than other women of her era, but they discovered possibilities that they didn't really grow up expecting to have. Uh, for Alexa, it was partly, you know, the, the experience that she would have uh, going to that Regina conference and seeing a woman uh, politician who was uh, very successful and Muriel Duckworth coming back here and, you know, people like that who, who gave her inspiration. Uh, she read Betty Friedan, which was uh, suggested to her by her mother. And then she became involved in community activism with the YMCA and that sort of led step by step to politics. But, you know, for me, you know, and I, and I, and I look back on it, I think I should not have been surprised by, by reading that in the letter. It was just, it was just the nature of the world, but to see it in blue and white, I guess is what you would call it since it was uh, good old ink on paper uh, days, just to see that and to realize how far the world has traveled uh, in the years since that, I mean, for, for young people, you know, that, 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 that's forever, but for many of us who, who grew up in that time, you don't think about it on a day-to-day -day basis, what's changing in the world. But when you get a chance to sort of find a marker like that, and then look mm -hmm. back and say, that was the way it was then. And, and things are, are different now. Uh, and we have come a ways, we may have a ways to go, but we've come a ways since, uh, the 1960s. Yeah, absolutely. Why was this such an important story for you to tell, Stephen? I think, uh, you, you know, one of the things that, that uh, uh, Megan Leslie mentioned, quoted from the book, um, about how, uh, which was she's quoting from the book, and I was quoting from uh, Justin Trudeau saying, why was the gender balance cabinet because it was 2015? Well, you know, when I looked at, when you look at Alexa and you think about how uh, successful she'd been in conventional terms, you know, how many times she'd been prime minister or leader of uh, Nova Scotia or any of those things, it's very quickly realized that none of those metrics really count in, in terms of, but she was very important. She has been very important because of the example she set. I think if people read the book and they read the, the, what she went through in Nova Scotia in the 1980s as the only woman uh, in the legislature, uh, which was a very hostile place, uh, not only to her as a new Democrat, but to her as a woman. And, and you see that, you know, her way of, of dealing with that was in some ways just to put her head down and keep going. Right. Uh, there was, she was not somebody who, talked about, uh, you know, or complained about those things in any way, except in a, in a, almost a humorous way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, she would talk about going, had no, th there was no women's washroom. So she had to go out of the legislature and down to the basement to, to the women's washroom down there, but she got to, to, to stand in line with other women and hear their stories and learn things that would influence her back in the legislature. That is a way of putting that, that puts it forward, makes it clear what's being done, but at the same time doesn't feel sorry for herself that in mm -hmm. fact directs. And, and I think that that went through her career. I remember hearing uh, of a, or talking to a politician who uh, had gone to complain to her, this is much later, uh, gone to complain to her about some sexist thing that had happened to her. And, and Alexa really said, just forget it, you know, don't forget it, forget it, but go ahead and, and keep going. Don't let that stop you or, or get in the way of, of what you're trying to do. And, you know, that was a, a particular kind of feminism uh, that I think she needed to have because she needed to be individually strong to demonstrate that she was not going to be pushed around by anybody. And that has allowed other women to, to I think, come in after her and and change the conversation in a lot of ways uh but she did that as well so i think for the, the importance of the book for me is not alexa the ndp leader not alexa the politician but alexa that larger uh figure historical figure mm -hmm. in a sense of, of who had uh made a difference in in her life and and deserves to be remembered for that deserves to be acknowledged for that for sure
Yeah, her story is truly inspirational. It is, it is for sure. We also received some questions from the audience about your experience of, um, of writing. Um, so one audience member asks, does writing usually energize or exhaust you? And what effect did writing this book have? Uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's energizing when you, it, it, it's, it's frightening when you sit down and you're looking at 100,000 words ahead of you. Uh, you don't know how you're going to fill it. Uh, and you, you know, th every day is a little bit further. You get a little bit further into the writing, a little bit further into the writing. And I, I've talked to this with students where, you know, for me, uh, you got to get to about 60% of the book written and then it sort of starts to write itself because you get into a, a rhythm and you get pushing forward. Uh, it, it can be frustrating a lot of the times. I mean, you know, I, when, when I talked earlier about the uh, court case, that court record, the divorce records, I th I'm thinking, how am I going to, this is important. How am I going to write this if I can't get the information to do it? Mm -hmm. And so that, that was a struggle for a long time until, you know, serendipitous, Dipidously, I found it, but uh, there's those kinds of things. Um, you know, as as uh, in the early days, those 20 hours of interviews that I had with Alexa went very well. Uh, but she was clearly affected by her own memory loss, and uh, after a while, stories repeated themselves. The thing is that they were always this, they they were the same; they they never changed. So that helped to to confirm things. And as you went further and researched them, they confirmed it. But you know, I think what what frustrates me most about it is that uh, I or someone else didn't start this process a long time ago. I think you know the to to have documented her uh, life earlier on when. Uh, she was more able to participate in a in a fully active way would have mm -hmm. been great, but you can't have that. Which provides a perfect segue, as a matter of fact, into um, our next audience question. Um, are you surprised that a book about Alexa has only now been written? I am. Uh, I hadn't really thought about it until I got into the writing of it. And, and then, as I said again earlier in the talk, I've had a couple of experiences where you know, going through those old letters and documents, I found uh, interesting letters from uh, journalists and authors uh, who had who were asking about writing a book uh, about Alexa, and it, you you don't always get the full uh, context of of the discussions that were going on. It never happened. I know that in uh, I think it was 2002 when she retired. I believe it was Jeffrey Simpson in the Globe and Mail asked her if she was, you know, if she was planning to write her uh, uh, memoirs, and she said, "No, I don't have any interest in doing that." Um, so, I, you know, I am surprised. I'm not. I'm grateful because <laughs> that gave me the chance to do it. So I'm happy with that. What do you uh, most hope that people will take away from reading this book? I think Alexa is. Um, a figure who who transcends politics, who uh, was important and is important to us uh, as a, a a change figure, somebody who who really did uh, want to change the world, set out to do it, and was never daunted uh, by the challenges that that came along during that time. So I think um, I hope that 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 people read it and. Uh, see, you know, she was she she, she was far from perfect, and and there 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 are lots of uh, uh, you know she was obsessive uh, about what she was doing, which is good for for the rest of us. But it's it's a hard on your personal life when you're uh, that obsessed with with work. Uh, you know, there's there's one quote in there uh, where she's saying basically that. Uh, she would rather uh, read a, a policy paper than go to a movie, you know, which, you know, sometimes I can understand, but I think is, is you know, it, it, it makes it hard uh, for a lot of the people around you. She, she uh, had huge, um, just huge loyalty from people who've worked for her, but they also admit that she's pretty driven and she's, you know, sometimes hard uh, on people. Um, not so much, uh, 
in 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 a mean way, but because she's obsessed with getting things right. And so, you know, she she was famous among her uh, uh, aides for her black felt marker, right, which would rip through uh, speeches. I th I think I was lucky. Maybe it was early on. I don't remember uh, her doing that to me uh, very much, although it may have just simply been that because of the way in which uh, I was doing these freelance speeches for her, um, I never saw her ripping them apart. Uh, so they, that that may have happened then too, but uh, that was you know she's she's a, a a a fully human being with all the faults that we have as human beings, but in the larger sense, uh, I think uh, hers is a life uh, that we can aspire to, and I think that's I hope that's one of the things people take out of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Is there something that didn't make it into the book that you kind of wish had? had made the cut? I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I, I sort of, uh, you know, some things that you, uh, and I do this with, with every book, I become obsessed with something uh, and I try to sort of push as much of it into the book as I can. I know that in the first draft of the book, the story of, of her grandparents' divorce probably took up what would end up being 10% of the book. Uh, I've done this before. I get, you know, as I said, I get obsessed with certain subjects and I start to, 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 to write them to death. And then some editor will come along and say, you know that uh, this, is, this happened, you know, 40 years before she was born. Maybe we should just move on and get to the point where she uh, is born and she's growing up and she's uh, doing all these important things. And, you know, I did learn a little bit from that. And, and, and so th that became a smaller part of the book. Uh, but, you know, I don't think there was anything, certainly one of, there was never any point where there were negative things to be said that I felt, oh, I can't say that, you know, that that's not that kind of book. But in fact, uh, there weren't many of those. And and uh, partly, I suppose, be, because I knew it was going to be seen as an authorized biography. And I think it's important in, in any sense, but certainly in that sense, to make it clear to people that, that you are not uh, engaged in hagiography, that you are really writing something mm -hmm real and serious, uh, that I would make sure that those things uh, got into the book as well. There was one, there's one, one scene in the book, uh, which happens at four o'clock in the morning or something where, and I just, I, I this is one of those letters I found uh, in the, in the files, uh, where she just rips apart uh, the person who is the provincial secretary uh, for his failures to do certain things in Cape Breton, which they, you know, they had agreed were important to be done, and he wasn't doing what, and this was a letter that, you know, like you could feel the heat on the page, even, you know, 30 years later, it was, she was mad, angry, and she was letting him know. Uh, so even though that wasn't necessarily typical, I thought it was, it was important that, that it be in there. I, I do have one other thing that, uh, you know, I, I wished I could have gotten in a little in a little more detail, uh, and that is uh, Jane's restaurant, uh, Jane's on the Common, which is a famous was a famous Halifax restaurant, uh, and Jane Wright was one of Alexa's aides, uh, both in Halifax and in Toronto. She's she, she's referred to in the book, but uh, she told me the story of how she came to decide to leave politics and open her restaurant and the support that she got from Alexa. I, I think I may have mentioned it a tiny bit in the, in the book, but to, to me, that was another example of Alexa outside of politics doing interesting human things mm -hmm. to support people. And, and, and she was that kind of, you know, she is that kind of person. So we're out of time for our Q&A segment. Um, thank you so much for that, Stephen Kimber. Um, what a wonderful end to the evening. Once again, I just want to remind our audience members that Alexa is available now um, in bookstores everywhere. You may purchase copies locally from the event's official bookseller, King's Co-op Bookstore. Um, you may purchase copies from Bookmark Halifax uh, or another independent bookseller near you. 
Alexa is also available for purchase um, at Chapters, Indigo, Kohl's, um, or online at www.gooselane.com. The Alexa McDonough Institute and Goose Lane Editions would like to thank everyone in the audience for joining us to celebrate this publication and with it, the career of groundbreaking political leader, champion of women, and human rights advocate, Alexa McDonough. All the best to each of you and good night. Thank you.